Okay, so good evening and um, welcome to the NYC Health and Hospitals Fiscal Year 2024 Annual Public Meeting for the Boroughs of Queens. Before we start the formal program, I would like to call to your attention that we have language translation service available in Bengali, Spanish, and French Creole. If you, have, if you require these services, please call 212-788-3359. So thank you. So my name is Jose Pagan. I'm chair of the NYC Health and Hospitals Board of Directors. And I want to thank you for joining us and would like to introduce the other board members who are participating. We have Dr. Patricia Martone, City Council Representative for Brooklyn. With us, Dr. Mitchell Katz, our President and CEO, and Jackie Rowe Adams, uh, our board, another board member. I would like to recognize Amir Abadi, Chief of Staff, representing the Office of New York City Council Member Natasha Williams, 27th District, Siri in a listening capacity. And also on the panel, and Andrea Cohen, Senior Vice President and General Counsel and Moderator for the evening, and Colicia Hercules, Secretary of the Corporation. So on behalf of the board, I would like to extend our thanks and acknowledge leadership at our Queens facilities, Helen Arteaga Landa Verde from Elmhurst and Neil Moore from Queens, uh, and their dedicated staff for providing exemplary service to our public health system and the people that we serve. So say hello and a lot of staff here. So. Uh, and to all of you here, thank you for your support as we strive to provide equal access to safe, affordable, quality care to all. So now I will turn the microphone over to our President and CEO, Dr. Katz. Hi. Thank you. Thank you, Jose, and good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Mitch Katz. I'm a primary care doctor and the proud president and CEO of New York City Health and Hospitals. This is uh, my seventh year here, uh, and we have an amazing 43,000 strong staff who every day uh, deliver high quality care. Many of them are in this room here, and we appreciate your being here. I want to thank my board members who came and the staff who spent long hours. It takes a lot of work to put together uh, these community meetings. Uh, thanks to the members of the public who came out. We're looking forward to hearing what you have to say, and we'll be listening um, and uh, working hard to make sure that the issues that you raise are resolved during the course of the year. I want to highlight some of the, the great things that have happened at Health and Hospitals um, in the last year. Uh, we opened the new Ruth Bader Ginsburg Hospital in South Brooklyn. If you haven't been there, you should go by and see. It's beautiful with an amazing uh, statue of the judge right out in the front. We were able to honor our nurses as they deserve with a equity uh, raise so that their pay uh, is equitable with other private hospitals. Uh, we remain a huge part of the city's uh, response to asylum seekers and run the arrival center and our humanitarian centers. Correctional Health opens a first ever reentry service center that's right as you leave Rikers so that people can stop and get a telephone and get uh, their referrals and their medical records. We have a lifestyle medicine program in every borough, including Queens at Elmhurst, so that people want to uh, care for their health through a combination of uh, plan forward diet, exercise, meditation, uh, sleep, Stress reduction, avoiding substances can get the care um, that they deserve. Uh, we uh, serve plant-based meals as the primary choice for dinner at all of our hospitals. And I can attest for when I was hospitalized at Bellevue that they are delicious. Um, uh, New York City Care, our program for those who cannot afford care or health insurance has hit 125,000 members. We've housed 500 patients. Newsweek ranked uh, CVU as the number one nursing home in New York State. That's in the entire state. Uh, for those people who don't believe that the public sector can perform, um, we have three of our other skilled nursing facilities ranked in the top 10, and the fifth was ranked in the top 30. This is a state with 600 nursing homes, so pretty amazing. Uh, we opened up a extended care unit uh, for patients who are discharged from psychiatric inpatient care and need continued support. 
um, at Kings County. We had nine new murals at a variety of facilities. Um, we broke ground for 93 unit apartments building at Woodhall. Uh, we distributed a million dollars in debt relief to 27 behavioral health providers in exchange for a three year commitment to staying in our health system. We launched telehealth medicine abortion services through virtual express care. So we're the uh, first public health system in the nation uh, to be able to provide women a choice uh, through virtual care. Uh, we were recognized by the American Heart Association and the AMA for high quality care in several areas. We expanded our services for survivors of intimate partner violence. Uh, we expanded our use of the Da Vinci surgical robots. The child abuse and prevention team launched a multi-year project with the uh, children's services, public policy to improve referrals. And then I just wanted to point out uh, the hospitals and clinics that we love in Queens. Um, so at uh, Queens Hospital, um, the hospital received a recognition award from the American Heart Association, get with the guidelines, stroke silver plus with target type two diabetes honor roll. Uh, Queens also was awarded a certificate of recognition from the American Heart Association um, for the care that it provides. Uh, last July, the hospital achieved successful accreditation as a geriatric emergency department bronze level. Assemblywoman Nilly Rosick secured a million dollars in state funds to upgrade the hospital hugs infant security and prevention system. Uh, in September 2023, under guidance from uh, our nurse leadership, the hospital implemented the care delivery management system, which enhances um, nurse practice. Uh, the hospital has once again received a leader in the 2024 Healthcare Equity Index Survey. Uh, last November, the hospital was awarded Silver Certification for Excellence in Person Centered Care from Plaintree. And in December, the hospital launched its robotic suite using the Da Vinci Surgical Robot. Um, Elmhurst, uh, the sister, our sister hospital in Queens, has also been uh, very busy. And, and uh, our thanks to the generous funding from our elected officials, uh, we were able to have a new 3D MAMO machine, a new nuclear medicine camera, new CT stimulator, a linear accelerator for treating cancer, and radiation oncology suite renovation, renovation of the operating rooms, a new wellness room for staff, solar panels on the roof, a new pa uh, pediatric scales, new OBGYN ultrasounds, and a new uh, CT scan. Hospital will soon be beginning construction on uh, having a new labor and delivery wing, a new endoscopic suite, or renovating the neonatal intensive care. Uh, and the hospital also received a large number of recognitions. And then uh, I also want to mention um, that we've been doing capital improvements at the Queens Neighborhood Health Centers, thanks to the borough president, um, and that Ridgewood Clinic has expanded its services to offer gynecology in order to uh, uh, meet the needs of the, its patients. Uh, it takes a huge number of people to make us succeed and the support of our board, our elected officials, the community-based organizations, and we're grateful all of them. Uh, now, uh, I'd like to proceed to the main purpose of today's meeting, which is hearing from all of you. Our general counsel, Andy Cohen, is going to explain how the process works. I'm looking forward to what everyone has to say. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Katz. Um, we're going to move now into this uh, second part of the evening, and I'm just going to give a moment on, um, on our purpose here and the rules of the road. So this is the very first one um, in uh, this um, this year, the first of five meetings that we conduct annually um, across the city's five boroughs. Um, the purpose is to inform the public, as Dr. Katz just did, about some of the um, latest um, uh, news activities and programs of New York City Health and Hospitals. And then second part, um, 
uh, which we are about to embark on now is to hear from you um, with your thoughts, ideas, comments, um, for our board uh, to hear from you on. Um, all of the testimony that we get this evening, and that includes both both oral comments that you people will be making um, this evening, as well as anything that people submit in writing, either in addition to their comments or just, you know, or just a, a copy of their um, comments will be given to our full board, our entire board um, for their review. Um, and so just understand that although we have, we have wonderful board members here um, with us, that we have even more board members who will be hearing from you um, once this evening is complete. Um, so, um, the rules of the road um, are as follows. Um, so the first, the most important thing to understand is that we are here to listen to you. The board is here to listen to you. It's not a Q&A session. It's not a dialogue. It is really an opportunity for you to speak un hopefully uninterrupted as long as you stay in your five minutes um, uh, and to share your thoughts about what's going on uh, here in the borough with New York City Health and Hospitals. Um, so in order for each speaker to have an opportunity um, to uh, share their thoughts, speakers are given five minutes of speaking time. On the podium over there in that corner um, is a timer with lights um, that will provide, um, yes, and here's an example right there, um, warnings about the expiration of a speaker's time. So um, the total time is five minutes. A yellow light will indicate that the speaker has two minutes left. Um, when uh, when your full time has expired, it will turn red, and within a few seconds, it will start to blink. And at that point, I'll ask you to finish your sentence, please. And anything else that you have to submit in writing, we are delighted to take. So uh, nobody nobody needs to worry that your ideas will not be shared, even if they are a little bit longer. But your time at the podium or your time at the microphone will expire. Um, uh, so if you do have additional comments to what you've been able to say out loud or you want to submit your full testimony in writing, you can to Calicia Hercules here to my left right um, and and can ensure that your comments, all of your comments are given to our board. Um, I'm working off of a list um, of people who've registered for the meeting, which includes name, um, a title that uh, that you've given and the organization that you're associated with. I mispronounce the name of a person or an organization, please forgive me and correct me um, in during your your time. Um, and I will do my best to both name the person who's coming up and the person who's coming right after them so that they can be prepared uh, on the aisle or otherwise uh, able to get um, to the uh, microphone as quickly as possible. So with that, I think we should uh, get started with this part of the evening. Um, and I will call our first speaker and then also name our second. Um, speaker. So the first speaker is Rodney Reed, representing Council Member um, Brooks Powers from District 31. Come on down to the microphone. And then the person after that, the speaker after that is Maxine Allen Brannon from the um, Queens Hospital Community Advisory Board. But Good evening. Great. Uh, as mentioned, Rodney Reed, legislative clerk for Councilwoman Majority Whip Sylvana Brooks Powers. Uh, first, thank you for this opportunity for Queens to represent themselves in um, their particular positions as it relates to health and hospitals and medical care. Um, I am speaking, like I said, in the capacity of Councilwoman and Majority Whip Brooks Powers, and I'm also a resident of Jamaica for over a lot of decades. Um, <laughs> that being said, um, the councilwoman represents the Far Rockaway Peninsula, Rosedale, Laurelton, Auburn, and I would be remiss if I did not thank Dr. Katz for his efforts with the councilwoman with the Far Rockaway Trauma Health Care Access Task Force. Um, this task force is firmly and working diligently to get a trauma center, we'll get a trauma center on the Rockaway Peninsula. It is, abs it is very difficult to know that there are over 15,000 EMS calls and more than 14,000 hospital transports, and more than seven of, 700 of these calls were trauma-related. Um, Dr. Katz knows the statistics. We're going to be providing more data that supports a prioritization 
of a trauma center in the Rockaway Peninsula and for South Jamaica. Um, and I would be remiss if I were not to point out that so many more lives could be saved if they had a trauma center on the peninsula, most notably our fallen hero, Officer Dillard, who was shot on the peninsula just two weeks ago. And there was a hospital, St. John's, three blocks away, but it doesn't have a trauma center. So they had to go to Jamaica Hospital, which took them with a police escort over 45 minutes. Valuable time that could have been <laughs> well managed to save that officer's life. Thank you again, and we will be providing data, I mean, a testimony. Great, thank you so much for your comments. Next speaker is Maxine Allen Brannon um, from the, the Secretary of the Queens Hospital Community Advisory Board, and after that will be Huisang Tamang. Hi, I'm Maxine Brannon, and just a bit about myself real quick. I was born here at Queens General Hospital back in 1957, and I've been a consumer on and off of my entire life. And now I'm a member of the CAB, which I truly love. Good evening, everyone. My name is Maxine Brandon, and I am a member of the New York City Health and Hospital Queens Community Advisory. I'm here to tell you about the status of Queens Hospital's equipment and infrastructure project and the plans that are currently underway to improve the hospital's physical integrity. Queens Hospital has been hard at work on designing a master plan initiative. Over the next five to 10 years, the hospital hopes to increase its inpatient bed capacity, meaning single rooms and ambulatory care capacity to construct a much needed parking garage to accommodate staff, patients, and visitors to eliminate overcrowding in the emergency department by and large in the areas and relocating ambulance entrances for improved flow. To increase and to build a cardiac catheterization suite so that we can afford service to the members of the community. Plans are underway to create a home dialysis training center in the end building. This project aims to renovate the existing 3,200 foot swimming pool area located in the end building where we are right now and into this usable space. The existing pool will require infill according to fit out the space for a new home dialysis training center. It's the first of its kind in our health center. A modified storefront wall entrance and ramp will be provided for direct patient access. There will also be a Queens retail pharmacy. The intent is to separate the outpatient pharmacy from the inpatient pharmacy and accommodate with a front end over the counter section to help ensure patients leave with everything they need in addition to their prescription. In addition, the moving of the outpatient pharmacy will enhance patients' accessibility and the renovation will improve workflow efficiency. Queens recently performed its first minimal invasive robotic surgery with a state-of-the-art Da Vinci surgical system. The new surgical option will improve clinical outcomes and the patient experience by allowing increased precision and accuracy, as well as faster recovery time. Looking toward the future, we are working towards renovation of our interventional radiology suite. The interventional radiology equipment has reached this end of life, which means it's no longer adequate in meeting the needs of our patients. The existing 580 square foot IR suite will be renovated with a new GE IR equipment system and will be expanded to 900 square feet to improve work. Also in the work, works of plans for MRI, MRI replacement and renovation. The MRI has reached its end of useful life and will be replaced with a new GE MRI. In addition, the MRI will, will be expanded to better establish the MRR safety zones and reconfiguration of associated support spaces for optimal work. Thank you for the opportunity to address you all this evening and thank you for coming out to Queens. Thank you so much for the comments. Next speaker is Louis Song Tamang, the um from the 
the chair of the community advisory board at Elmhurst Hospital. And after that will be Stephen Monroe. Not able to make it today. So Stephen Monroe, um, who is a um, community advisory board member and employee at Queens Hospital. And after that will be Marva Dudley. Good evening. And welcome to Queen's Hospital Centre Public Hearing. My name is Stephen Monroe, Chair of the Labour Caucus and Co-Chair of the Hospital Joint Labour Management Committee. I am also serve as an Executive Member of the Hospital Committee Advisory Board. I am del delighted to be here to participate in this forum, an opportunity for us to become acquainted and share our ideas and concern for the betterment of Queen's Hospital. Over the years, Queen's Hospital has benefited from having a highly skilled and motivated team of doctors, nurses, as well as a form of professional staff that wit, which is eager to execute initiatives for long-term improvement. If you have been as familiar with Queen's Hospital as I have, you have witnessed the palatable changes that have taken place over time. And it is the people who work here in all facets and capabilities who have made this happen. I'm here today to speak to you about patient safety and satisfaction here at Queen's. First and foremost, Queen's Hospital received a Leapfrog Hospital Patient Safety Grade Score of A for the fall of 2023 and was one of, the, uh, and was one of only three hospitals in the borough of Queen's to earn an A or B grade. This survey uses 22 national perform, um, performance measures from CMS, plus information from other supplementary data sources, including data on hospital acquired infection and patient satisfaction scores. The survey includes both process and outcome of measures, each about 50% of the overall score and more than 2,600 acute care hospitals participated in this survey. Patient experience and person-centered care continue to be a priority at Queen's Hospital. In 2023, we received the silver certification in patient-centered care by Plain Tree International. Worldwide, where, where there are only 185 organizations that are plain tree certified and only 65 that receive silver designation. As part of our continuing improvement efforts, all services lines and, and review, all services lines and review that data and, and, com, and commitments from the patient satisfaction survey. Our, our satisfaction include the following, ambulatory, ambulatory care scores for recommitted, for, for recommended, this provision, this provider office increased from 83.9 in 2022 to 87.9 in 2023, an increase of 2.5%. Emergency department overall scores increased from 75.9 in 2022 to 76.2 in 2023, an increase of 0.4%. Inpatient behavioral health overall score rose from 72.9% in 2022 to 86.8% in 2023, an increase of 9.6%. And outpatient behavioral health overall score rose from 80.6 in 2022 to 82 to 88 in 2023, an increase of 9.2%. Queens is also formally in accordance with Queens is also formally in accordance with our president, Mitch Katz's recent initiative known as I Care with Kindness. In our daily activities, we are striving to, to merge our I Care values of integrity, compassion, accountability, respect, and excellence. It is a culture of kindness in everything we do. We, we are recognizing the interests and values of saying, the five words that sum up our reason for being, how many, how, how may I help you whenever we encounter a patient? 
In my role as chair of the Hospital Labor Caucus, I continue to steadfast with the, cost, with the cost of labor with an aim to keep Queen's Hospital a place where patients can come and receive the best health care in this part of Queen's. Thank you for coming and providing me the opportunity to address you this afternoon. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker is Marva Dudley, also a member of the Community Advisory Board for Queen's Hospital. And after that is Carla Leon. Good evening. My name is Marva Dudley, and I am a member of the Community Advisory Board. But I come here to speak to you today not as not only as a member of the Community Advisory Board, but also as a former patient. Back in November of 2017, I was not feeling well at all, having um, problems breathing. I basically shrugged it off. Thank goodness I had I was actually at the time living next door to my parents, came over to see me. My mother knew something was wrong. We went to urgent care. After running tests, all they said to me was, you need to go to a hospital. My mother, who has been coming here regularly for many years, before I could even answer, she said, you're going to Queens Hospital. I came here to Queens Hospital only to be told that I had multiple blood clots in both lungs and I was diagnosed with a pulmonary embolism. I will stand here today and say that Queens Hospital saved my life. The care that I received, not only from the doctors, but, and not taking any away from the doctors, but the nurses, truly amazing. The way they treated me and just um, so personable, because at one point, um, the attending ER physician wanted me to take um, pills and it was a, it was a large quantity of them. Um, I don't remember, but I know it had to do with, I guess to, I know I'm saying layman's terms, I guess to break down the clots in addition to the, um, the injections I was getting as well of blood thinner. And I remember saying, am I going to supposed to really take all these? And the nurse said to me, yes, the doctor said so. And I'm going to stand here and watch you take every one. And I just remember that. And again, I remember just the care that I received. And I do say it is because of Queens Hospital that I am standing here today. Thank you. And it's been a pleasure in speaking with you this evening. Thank you so much. The next speaker is Carla Leon, um, also from the Elmhurst uh, Community Advisory Board. And after that is Raj Punjabi. Good evening, everyone. My name is Carla Leon, and I am a member of the New York City Health and Hospitals Elmhurst Community Advisory. For several years, Elmhurst has had a strategic partnership with the Queens Public Library to provide much needed health information to library patrons and community members. While they couldn't be here tonight to testify about this partnership, QPL, Queens Public Library, did provide a written statement that I wish to share with you today. Dear Elmhurst and Queens Hospital, Hospitals Community Advisory, please allow me this opportunity to express my gratitude to Health and Hospitals, Elmhurst and Queens Hospitals for their deep, longstanding, and ever-evolving partnership with Queens Public Library. When I first started working at the library in 2007, the Queens Cancer Center of Queens Hospital was my very first program partner. Linda Bulon, research nurse manager and exceptionally committed patient advocate, would come out and speak regularly at our libraries. Since then, Linda's programming has been extended to virtual platforms and to include and center library employees, many of whom have contacted Linda directly regarding their personal health or customer needs. In each of these instances, Linda has gone above and beyond to offer support and guidance. In 2016, I met Atia Butler, the Director of External Affairs and Marketing at h, h Elmhurst. She has been an incredible resource in connecting the library 
with regular programming on a wide array of medical topics, which she helps us to ensure are culturally tailored appropriately. The program topics cover a range of physical and behavior health issues and for various age demographics. The Elmhurst team of providers are also always open to health-related programming for QPL employees. Our staff represent our Queens communities and also hold leadership roles within them. So these employee focused programs are critically important. I appreciate this opportunity to express my sincere thankfulness to two extraordinary individuals, Atia Butler and Linda Bulon, as well as all of our incredible Queens partners at Health and Hospital. Your care and commitment have been unwavering and are deeply appreciated. I'm eager to see how our partnership will continue to evolve to best serve our diverse Queens communities in the years to come. With gratitude, Tamara Mitchell, MPH, uh, Deputy Health and Wellness Officer. Thank you very much. Raj Punjabi, Elmhurst Hospital Community Advisory Board member. And after that will be uh, uh, Jeho Youssef. Good evening to all the board members and executives of NYC HN hospitals. And very good evening to all my brothers and sisters present in this hall. My name is Raj Punjabi, and I'm a member of NYC Health Elmas Community Advisory Board. I'm also a vice chairperson, and I'm going to speak about very good things about our hospital. NYC Hospital Elmas is now silver certified in excellence in person-centered care. This certification recognizes how Elmas is focusing on delivering an experience that is more human-centric than ever for patients, their loved ones, and staff members. Elmer's Patients and Guest Service team opened the Guest Service Center less than a year ago. Located in the hospital's main lobby, it offers a fully renovated, calming, and private environment where patients can share their experiences, or whenever needed, they can also request assistance for with making appointments or assess their electronic medical records. The hospital continues to deploy its care experience ambassador program in the emergency department and in the med surgical units. This program allows hospital ambassadors to connect more personally and closely with patients and deliver a more personalized care experience. Elmas Hospital is also proud of the fact that care experience ambassador Phil Jackson has been recognized as 2023 Amazing Employee of the Year for the entire NYC hospital's health system. Elmas Hospital also recently announced a partnership with EHL Hospitality Business School. EHL was ranked world's number one university for hospitality and leisure management for the last five years. Elmas is the first American hospital to join the EHL Alliance. This collaboration represents a significant milestone in the intersection of hospitality and healthcare, as the hospital joins forces to share best practices and resources in the ever evolving landscape of patient care. The seamless integration of spiritual care, with the care experience umbrella has been achieved through the concentrated efforts of onboarding volunteers, expanding faith services and recruiting chaplains, extending support to a broader spectrum of patients families and staff members of our culturally diverse community. In addition to these great developments, Elmas Hospital continues to be recognized nationally for its, for its commitment to excellence in healthcare. The hospital received diamond recognition from the American College of Surgeons for its operating suites. The hospital also received a renewed patient-centered medical home, designation from the National Committee for Quality Assurance. American Heart Association recognized the excellent case Elmas provides to patients with diabetes, cholesterol, and high blood pressure with Gold and Gold Plus Awards. American Heart Association also recognized Elmas for its commitment to providing outstanding care in the categories of heart failure, heart attack, stroke, and resuscitation. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity to speak, you, speak to you today. I look forward to continue to work with the CAB and Elmas Hospital leadership to ensure that our community gets the care that it needs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is uh, Jayo Youssef, um, Community Relations Specialist from Metro Plus Health. And after that will be Tiffany Hicks. 
Good evening, everyone. My name is AJ. I am a community relations specialist at Metro Plus Health. Metro Plus Health is a health plan that is owned entirely by the New York City Health and Hospital System, serving 700,000 of its residents. At Metro Plus Health, we believe in people over profits. Thank you to the board for allowing me to speak briefly about the wonderful partnership that we have with Health and Hospital Queens. Metro Plus is proud of our partnership with Queens Hospital and Elmhurst Hospital. We are especially proud of our work together to promote preventative health and wellness in the community. This past year, Metro Plus collaborated closely with both the, both of these hospitals to do a to host a series of uh, community events that helped bring facilities closer to the community. These events range from honoring nurses during nurse week to providing backpacks during the beginning of the school year. We're also working closely with hospitals in Queens to ensure everyone that is eligible for insurance gets coverage. For example, we work with OBGYN departments to assist in enrolling new mothers and their newborns, as well as with the pediatrics department to assist in smooth enrollment of children and their families. At Elmhurst, we, are, we also recently enhanced our presence there uh, to better assist with uh, community questions regarding insurance, uh, and enrollment. And thank you to the staff there for always having an open line of communication with us. As a member of Health and Hospitals family, we hope to continue this important work. And thank you uh, so much to everyone for being here today. Thanks so much for the comments. Next speaker is Tiffany Hicks, uh, principal at um, PS 160Q, Walter Francis Bishop Magnet School of the Arts. And after thank that, you. we'll be uh, Shornette Walters. Just uh, good evening. My name is Tiffany Hicks, and I'm the principal of the Walter Francis Bishop Magnus School of the Arts, PS160, located in South Jamaica, Queens. We are a Title I school, and we embrace and educate 665 beautiful Black and Brown children every single day. I stand before you this evening to speak about the benefits and impact of the New York Health and Hospitals on-site mental health partnership within my school community. As I am seven months into my 11 years as principal, I have been fortunate enough to be able to call Dr. Lydia Benson and prior to Dr. Philemy, Dr. Schneck partners. They are interwoven within the fabric of our school and these services are a part of our core foundation and mission to educate the whole child. Many of you here in the medical field know the importance of catching things early and there is no reason why we should not also be able to address the mental health and wellness of children and provide support to their families early. There are some needs that are beyond our scope and to have experts on site is not only beneficial, but should be the norm in all schools. When parents are at their wits end and teachers aren't sure of what to do, the answer is a few feet away. When the needs of families are met, root causes understood and appropriate services provided, children are able to acclimate, adjust, fully experience the academic education that they not only deserve, but are entitled to. If you are expanding or continuing these programs and the question, your, the answer to this question this evening should be an astounding yes. Our children deserve every advantage, support, and helping hand. With partnerships like this, we can turn these dreams into a reality. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Shornette Walters, PTA president at the Queens Gateway to Health Sciences Secondary School. And then Breda Hosting. Good evening. Thank you for this invitation to speak this evening. My name is Shernet Walters, and I'm a grade eight parent at Queens Gateway to Health Sciences Secondary School. I'm here with some of our parents and students. Uh, we're in close proximity to the hospital, right around the corner on Gothals Avenue. We are a grade six to grade 12 school. I serve as the PTA president for Queens Gateway. As our school is part of the diverse community that Queens Hospital Center serves, I will use this time to share the unique relationship that has been reestablished with Queens Hospital Center and their impact on our school community. About a year ago, a few of our families and our students shared with me their reasons for coming to Queens Gateway. One of the major selling points for them choosing Queens Gateway as their school was the expectation to have a collaborative relationship between the hospital and our academia. There was an expectation that with our school as a health and sciences curriculum based environment, our students who had curiosity or ambition about the healthcare field 
would have a collaborative pathway program with Queens Hospital Center. After an extensive fact-finding mission, I learned that there was once a robust mentor program between Queens Hospital and Queens Gateway established approximately 20 something years ago. <laughs> For the last five to six years, it has been dormant. Students have been coming here on their own. I took it upon myself last summer to reach out to the volunteer department and spoke with the director, Sandra, Ms. Sandra Springer. Ms. Springer provided a wealth of history along with the benefits the relationship had produced to many of our students in the past. I also had the pleasure of meeting and working with Associate Executive Director of External Affairs, Mr. Cleon Edwards. With his dedication and tireless efforts, he reviewed many of my proposals for structuring a collaborative pathway program to Queens Gateway to create an amazing opportunity for them to observe careers in healthcare. It will provide students the opportunity to explore interest in science and healthcare, regardless of the area of health they want to pursue in the future. It will introduce students to clinical and non-clinical work environments at Queen's Hospital. He was instrumental in getting the program greenlit. The goal of the program is to enhance the students' educational, professional, and personal development. It will foster students' interest in the range of careers possible in a hospital setting. It will allow the students to also learn invaluable hands-on experience where possible and earn community service hours from observing the variety of career avenues at the hospital. Through the collaboration with Queen's Hospital, students' participation will have them interacting and networking with staff, some of which can become mentors and contacts to help guide them on their education and career goals. The opportunities will not be limited to medical careers. A wealth of areas to shadow professional medicals or otherwise can be covered. The program will provide for assemblies and roundtables and class presentations for middle school students as well. The support of the Queens Hospital medical community along the journey of which many of your staff have children attending Queens Gateway. Their excitement so far for it rolling out in spring is to be commended. In conclusion, as Dr. Dave Holston, your Queens Hospital Center's Chief Medical Officer pointed out to me when I met him in January, the positive impact of such a relationship with our school is evident. He recalled the first student he mentored Almost 30 years ago, despite the student's hesitance, that student found his way to become a renowned cardiologist, a gateway student. What we hope is to have Queens Gateway be a feeder pathway for students to gain experience from Queens Hospital that will have them better prepared in their life choices in the health field. They will learn that it is never too early to know your path. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. The next speaker is Reda Hossein, Community and Government Affairs Liaison with Live on New York. And the speaker after that is Merlene Smith Sotillo. Reda Hossein. Okay, no problem. Uh, next speaker is Merlene Smith Sotillo, President and CEO of the Sickle Cell uh, Awareness Foundation Corp. And the speaker after that will be Jim Burke. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a yeah. pleasure to be here. Just want to say thank you to Queens Hospital for giving us the platform and the opportunity to be here this evening. As I said, my name is Merlene Smith Sotelo, the president for the Sickle Cell Awareness. I'm also a CAB member here and a patient care member. The Sickle Cell Awareness Foundation also known as SCAFCI, has been an advocate for individuals with sickle cell disease and sickle cell trait from its inception. All operations have included advocacy, awareness, and education as part of our responsibility with regards to sickle cell. As we continue in this role, we have been able to enhance the presence of Queen's Hospital Center as a provider of quality healthcare in the community. Annual, um, annually, SCAF Corp has hosted Sickle Cell Research Symposium at this very hospital. In attendance were health professionals from other health and hospital facilities and professionals from private health institutions like North Shore Hospital, residents from various parts of New York City and other health stakeholders. As our um, symposium, the Queen Hospital has the opportunity to showcase its program for sickle cell patients and their families. 
The symposium also attracted patients and their families, some of whom may choose to make Queens Hospital Center the place to obtain quality health care. SCAF has been very vocal about the steps the hospital has taken to provide special, specialized emergency services to the sickle cell patient population. Participated in numerous health fairs in Queens neighborhood and Staten Island and has been advertising the hospital role in tracking this disease. We advocate for population that face health disparities and appreciate the partnership with Queens Hospital Center that assists us in attaining our goals. The population in areas as far as Rockaway and Queens, individuals face significant barriers in obtaining health care. We want to strengthen the partnership with Queens Hospital Center as we forge toward advocacy, educate, and bring awareness to sickle cell disease. We want this partnership to serve as an example as how community stakeholders can combine efforts for the betterment of our community. We want Queens Hospital Center to be one of the state's centers of excellence in caring for our sickle cell patients. Queen Hospital had participated in our South Queens community meeting organized by Senator James Saunders Jr. These meetings provided yet another forum to specialize the excellent care available at this hospital and participated in the Rosedale Lions Club is also a positive. We are unable to provide statistics on how many patients have chosen Queens Hospital Center to obtain this care after attending our programs, but an educated guest will definitely show the outcome has been positive. Thank you, Queens Hospital Center, as being part of our needed support system. I just want to say I have patients who has been at this hospital here today. I also have members of our Lions Club here representing us today. So thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Jim Burke, co-founder of 34th Avenue Open Streets Coalition. And after that is Ken. Thank you for having me today. Uh, I'm here as a, a patient sometimes, but I'm really here as a community member. Um, 34th Avenue Open Streets Coalition manages 26 blocks of open space in Jackson Heights, 365 days a year. And because of the amazing team at Elmhurst Hospital, we've had some really fun interactions uh, with Elmhurst. One of the best programs they have is Walk with a Doctor. So it's <clears throat> pretty amazing to have uh, a doctor from every kind of different walk of life, different nationality. Each time they came, it was a different, a, a different doctor with a different specialty. They talked about asthma, they talked about heart disease, they talked about allergies. And uh, a lot of um, our neighbors said it was the longest they've ever spoke to a doctor. They said usually when they see a doctor, they get so scared and they forget all their questions. But because we had this hour long walk that culminated uh, with, we usually have at the end, all these kids playing and, and all the kids also get to ask the doctors these questions and they look up to these doctors speaking their languages. And so that's one of the best programs you did. I have another hat and I run the 82nd Street bid programming and we did an amazing uh, how to cook healthy. And it was like a talk show right there in the open street on how to cook healthy. And that was another thing that was just wonderful. Uh, the other thing is the team, Clara and Nancy Atia, have been out with all, all through of, uh, our programming and done blood pressure checks. And we just talked about uh, some upcoming pulmonology things that we're going to do together. So I just want to say I love them. They really come to our community. They help. They really care. And then on a private note, uh, they saved my life a few years ago when I had a, a major heart attack. And the care I received there is why I'm standing before you. And the people there were so wonderful. And the nurses and the doctors followed up afterwards. And I get to see them in the street. And just uh, very, very thrilled and grateful for Elmhurst Hospital. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Next speaker is Kent Lee, Senior Project Coordinator for Korean Community Services of Metropolitan New York. And after that is Albert Trott. Um, hi, uh, good uh, rainy uh, evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Kent Lee. Uh, I work as a Senior Project Coordinator at um, the CBO uh, Korean Community Services. Uh, so, um, the point of my speech today is to focus on NYC care. Um, so cases has been a partner with a uh, health and hospital since. Um, September of uh, 2020, uh, so we serve our communities by helping the uninsured New Yorkers get um, health insurance. And that um, we initially started at Bayside Queens, but we decided that the communities when Corona flushing. And now Long Island City needed like the services. So we've been so we've been continuing expanding and serving the communities there. Um so on the behalf of the community, um when I say that help and hospital has literally been saving lives, I, I meant it because many of our community members had told us that, you know, without MIC care, like you know, they wouldn't be here. So I want to thank everyone from Health and Hospital. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker is Albert Trotman, a volunteer. And after that, Aaron Ramirez. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Glad to be here to see everyone. Good evening, panel and guest. My name is Albert Trotman. And a little bit about myself I'm happily married, two children, and I have one on the way. And I am, I am a worker, um, school bus driver. I'm also a community server. I serve in uh, the union, uh, TW Local 100. So I also serve uh, my coworkers. And it's exciting because it allows me to interact in the community. However, um, I had a crisis last year. I had my crisis. Um, I have sickle cell trait. So it comes in large gaps, but when it comes, you don't think about the gaps, it just comes. And I was in extreme pain and I told my wife, um, I need to go to the hospital. And she said, uh, okay, let's do it. And I went to urgent care and they recommended the closest hospital, which to my surprise was not in my best interest. So I get there and I'm there and I'm still sick and they're going through the procedures and I'm still sick. Actually, I'm getting worse. But it was an experience that I was trying to deal with because in my mind, I was thinking I'm in a hospital. I'm supposed to be getting better. You would think not the case. So moving fast forward, I told my wife with a wonderful smile, we're getting out of here. And we left with pain that was increasing. And I mean, in my joints and everything. So I did a quick search, Google it, and I came across this wonderful um, organization called the Sickle Cell Awareness Foundation. And I called and I spoke with Miss Merlene and she was so helpful, made me feel comfortable. Even though I was in pain, she understood me. So I felt I was getting somewhere. So as I spoke with her and she was assessing me, and asking me questions that I felt someone was listening and her husband was right on point. And they recommended Queens Hospital. And she set everything up and I was excited just listening. I haven't reached here yet, but I was excited, still in pain. So to cut a long story short, what I'm sharing with you is I'm just a typical simple guy that I needed help. I needed help and I didn't know how to ask for the help because I went to a hospital and I thought they were gonna help me. But when I came to Queens Hospital, I didn't have to say anything. I watched and I began to feel better. I was admitted the necessary painkillers. They were addressing my needs as a sickle cell crisis. I am so grateful to what you're doing here at Queens Hospital. And I'm watching my time. I see yellow. So. <laughs> I am so excited because I also met Linda Bulan. I don't know if she's here. Yes, no problem. I met her and the little dog. My son loved the dog. 
and my son wanted to chase the dog. I said, don't do that. Be nice to the dog. And she came to me and she said, I wanted to make sure I got to you because Merlin said I have to come to you. And she did. Because Merlin set it all up. So I was feeling good. And everyone was treating me very nice. And I was feeling better and I was getting better. So what I'm saying to you is when you go to the hospital, you anticipate that you're going to feel better. But if the hospital doesn't know how to treat you, you don't feel better. So I'm so grateful to all of your efforts, Ms. Merlin, and your foundation, because her work and her tenacity, and she's still going, I was able to get treated and I feel better. Not the red light yet. So I am just excited to be a part of this and to support because as a sickle cell patient with the trait, when it hits, it hits. And it's so good to know I can hit Queens Hospital and feel better. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Karen Ramirez, Social Work Chapter Chairperson for Local 768, DC 37. And after that is Jane Lima Negron. Hi, everybody. I asked them to do a mic check short people earlier, so I guess this should be good enough. I'm not going to touch it. It works. Thank you. This is why we're heels at work. Um, <laughs> so my name is Karen Ramirez. I'm a social worker at Elmer's Hospital. I've been there for almost 10 years now. I don't have a prepared speech. I wasn't really ready to talk. I've just gotten over the flu, so just getting a little bit better. Um, but I'm back at work where I love doing what I do. I work inpatient for most of my career at Elmer's. Right now, I'm working in the ID clinic, outpatient, different, but similar. And I love serving my community. I love doing what I do. And I love being able to work multiple disciplines, working with the multiple cultures. I come to Elmer's Hospital, being able to provide uh, great care for my patients. I have so many patients come to me, inpatient, outpatient, and tell me how great the care that we provide, medical, social work-wise, everything for them. Um, and I want to continue to be able to provide that type of care. I just wanted to bring to light that we're social workers. We are city social workers. We are masters, educated social workers who are not earning the same as or nearly what other private hospital social workers earn, but we stay where we are because we love what we do. We're not there for the money. Um, I am myself a bilingual social worker. I am trained, medically certified to interpret as well. Actually, health and hospitals paid for that program, which I'm very grateful. I don't get paid extra for speaking my language and for providing care in the language that helps and gives culturally appropriate care for my patients, which helps them. Most of the time after my patients will see the doctors, they'll come to me and they'll be like, oh, by the way, I've been having this pain right here. Like, did you tell your doctor? No, I didn't. Um, they feel shy to tell an interpreter, but they'll feel comfortable telling the social worker. And that's where we collaborate and help out um, with doctors. And again, didn't have a prepared speech was getting over my flu, but I'm glad to be here and representing my union as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Jane Lima Negron, um, the social work chapter vice chair from local 768, of DC 37. And after that will be Nathan Franco. Thank you, everyone. Good evening, board members and my fellow attendees. My name is Jane Lima Negron. I am a social work supervisor for H&H &H Gotham Health, and I've been a social worker for, only, uh, for nearly 10 years. I'm here today in the capacity as the vice chair for the social work chapter for DC 37. I wanna just say that I was born at Elmhurst Hospital. I was raised in Queens, and I became a frontline social worker in 2014. I have loved working with my patients, and representing the eye care values. When the city closed due to the pandemic, 
I was one of the hundreds of social workers that responded to the call to action. I went to the front line and provided care for all of our patients. I wanna raise awareness about an issue that has occurred in terms of the implementation of the contract, the recent DC 37 contract. In 2022, H&H &H applied a salary adjustment to be able to retain and recruit social workers that were leaving in massive numbers because they were burned out from the pandemic. When the new contract was implemented, the wages, the wage increase did not include that salary adjustment. So basically in lieu of a, a salary adjustment, in lieu of the wage increases, we were exited, exiled from that a, improvement, from that increase. Now, we have done our due diligence. We've collected our signatures. We've submitted our grievance uh, back in November of 2023, and we are yet to hear a hearing date. So this is why we are here representing our efforts because we want to be able to hear explicitly why it was not implemented the way that it was implemented for the mayoral agencies. Because again, when there was a call to action, we responded. So we want to hear the same thing. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Nathan Franco, second vice president for Local 768 of DC 37. And after that, Sharon Bryant. Uh, my name is Nate Franco. I'm a social worker at Harlem Hospital. I've been there for 14 years now. Um, my history with H&H &H goes back, honestly, er way earlier. My grandmother was uh, trained in nursing and worked at Bellevue. My grandfather worked at Bellevue, then met, and eventually actually at Queens here as well. Um, so, you know, Harlem has been at the center of my career. And, and the bottom line is I wanted to be at the center of so many other social work careers and H&H &H to be at the center of so many other social work careers. But we are struggling the same way that Karen and Jane talked about. Um, we just wrapped up Social Work Month in March, uh, and we recognize the tremendous uh, work that social workers do throughout H&H. &H. Many of the leaders in H&H &H, and, of course, throughout public health recognize the impact of social determinants uh, on the ability of our clients uh, to receive the most benefit possible from the care of our colleagues amongst the medical and behavioral health providers. And um, what we do in H&H &H is quite honestly more challenging than the work of medical social workers in other uh, private hospitals. Uh, if you have a private hospital that says, we only admit you if it's a planned admission, a scheduled procedure, well, that already weeds out all of the, the sort of instability that so many of our clients come with. Um, so we, we have very stressful jobs, which we know that, that the leadership appreciates and understands. And that's why we were so excited to see the investment in 2022 saying, hey, we know that we don't have to pay you the absolute minimum guaranteed by the contract. We can actually invest in social work. And that was wonderful. And it was unfortunately kind of devastating when we get a contract negotiated with the mayor, implemented an H&H &H out of all the city agencies, out of whatever dozens of city agencies, H&H &H is the only one that says, hey, we're going to try to split this hair and get out of paying the 3% raise that the, that the mayor agreed upon. So we submitted this grievance and we, we spoke, well, we emailed with Dr. Katz, who of course emailed right back and his credit always has every time we've reached out. But that was in November. We submitted that grievance. We're supposed to get a, a hearing date within 10 days. It's been four months. We have not had a hearing date. We have had multiple phone calls, emails, follow-up. Nobody has offered a date for a hearing. So unfortunately, I think we start to lose faith in the process. These are the procedures that we've set up, our contract procedures, our grievance procedures, you know, and we start to lose faith that the system or the procedures are worth the paper they're printed on. And honestly, they're online now, so maybe it's not the paper. But Regardless, we lose faith. And when we lose faith in the process, we just exit. Now, I haven't. I, I've been here a really long time and I'd love to stay here. Karen, Jane, so many of us do stay, but we're losing colleagues that we've invested years in training, training to work in a way that no other healthcare system really works. 
And we're losing those skills every day because people go to jobs that are quite frankly easier. It's just easier to be a medical social worker in a place where your clients are so much, uh, have, have more means. So not only is it easier, but you're gonna get 20% raise. That's, that's a pretty easy decision to make for so many of our coworkers when they lose faith in the process. So we know you're not gonna answer us tonight. We want a hearing. We want you to do the right thing. We want you to honor the investment that was promised, not the, not the 3% that the mayor agreed. You invested in us. We want you to honor that. And we want to hear, have a hearing to, to, to discuss the details. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. The next speaker is Sharon Bryan, Social Work Chapter Secretary, also for Local 768 DC 37. And after that is Yvonne Fredier. Sharon Bryan, not here, okay. Yvonne Fredier, Fredier. Uh, David Sutcher, social worker with New York City Health and Hospitals. And after that is Joseph Kennedy. Good evening. My name is David Sutcher, and I've been proudly employed by Elmhurst Hospital as a social worker for over two years on our ACT team, which is one of the highest levels of psychiatric outpatient mental health treatment available to vulnerable New Yorkers. Over time, I've gotten to learn more about our leadership teams and how Elmhurst strives to always improve by being a member of the Person-Centered Steering Committee, which was earlier referenced by a CAB member. When the comptroller voiced concerns in June 2023 over the payment and utilization of travel nurses at h and and the mayor wanted lower raises for our nurses, Dr. Katz, you responded by bravely pushing back against the mayor, and you secured our fantastic nurses higher raises and reduce the utilization, utilization and financial burden of travel nurses. I applaud you for that. Your emails to us have always been thoughtful, and I believe you really care about your staff. That's why I'm hoping to be heard now. On behalf of 1,000 plus social workers, we're asking for fairness when interpreting how the citywide contract raises should be implemented by h and &H. We know mayoral agencies have been directed that the 3% yearly citywide contract raises are to be in addition to any voluntary raises. However, as said, h, &H doesn't interpret this the same way. And Dr. Katz, you told us you don't believe there's a legal obligation to do so. And as Nate said, we've waited more than four months for a hearing with h, &H Labor Relations. I can't fathom that being done to the nurses' union. Dr. Katz, if you say on this course, on this course you're telling 1,000 plus social workers under your care that there is a hierarchy and social workers are less worthy for you to fight for. You're incentivizing experienced h, h social workers and new social workers to the field to look elsewhere, such as Northwell, where the equivalent of a level two LMSW can earn up to 106,000. NYP, the range is 85 to 116. Mount Sinai and NYU, up to 95,000. I checked the other day. These are LMSW, not LCSW positions. In contrast to h, h a level two can expect uh, about 73,000 for an LMSW. It's not until a level five is an LCSW that h, h starts to compete with those ranges. If we don't close the substantial gap, we're gonna lose talented and experienced social workers to other hospital systems. Look at the staffing data and you're gonna see a trend of LMSWs coming in, earning the, their LCSWs after three years and leaving soon after. There is nothing worse for productivity and billing than turnover. Even worse is the so far insufficient response by leadership to thwart this trend. And according to a February article from Cranes, the citywide surplus now exceeds $3 billion. You know, we always hear the importance of mental health and social workers, especially last month during a social work month. But it's kind of hard to read any messages uh, that come through as anything but performative when there's no investment to match the message. Dr. Katz, why am I regularly receiving hiring emails about temporary social work positions within h, h that are double my current rate? The city has the money to compete. I mean, do we need another letter from the comptroller for you to act? I love my team. I love my immediate supervisor. I love Helen. Helen is an amazing CEO for Elmhurst. Uh, and Dr. Katz, 
my confidence in you has always been high. Uh, and I believe the city confidence in you has been equally high, you know, judging by open payroll's record of your own compensation, which was more than 689,000 in 2020, 740,000 in 2021. That's a 7.4 increase in one year, more than our 3% yearly increases that we secured. I want to be here long term, but I don't really know if me and my fellow social workers are going to see the ded our dedication reciprocated financially. You know, remember the raises, the, the salaries at other places are much more, 10,000 or more. And a colleague of mine just passed their LCSW, and I'm worried we're going to lose them. Searching our career page for social work job postings, uh, there's 83 level two positions and 41 level three positions. That's a lot of billable opportunity loss due to lack of staffing. You know, I believe it's because our compensation is lacking, the annual accrual time is terrible, and that, um, you know, lack of 403B matching. We don't have to be the best in all three of those, but we can't be the worst in all three either. You know, I hope you're going to do the right thing for us and invest in us as you did with the nurses contract that you proudly pointed out earlier. Again, I really love to be here. I want to make an impact, but I hope that you invest in us as we're invested in our community, supporting people like this. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. The next speaker is Joseph Kennedy, um, a licensed clinical social worker at NYC Health and Hospitals Queens. And after that is Eileen Garvin Kazan. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Joseph Kennedy. Uh, I'm a social worker here at Queens Hospital Center, and I have been a social worker here since September 19th, 1988. 36 years I've been a social worker, and I've been a proud social worker and a proud member of DC 37, 768. <clears throat> this hospital has been good to me as a child. I've been, I came here as a child. Uh, I was once uh, here, I was treated here. My family was treated here. My niece and nephew was born here. And uh, like I said, I'm very proud. And I always wanted to be a social worker here at Queens Hospital Center. I dedicated my life because I'm uh, from a family of 11 children, both my mother and father. And uh, we were in a two bedroom apartment. <clears throat> so I dedicated my life to be here to be an example as a young black man and as a, a male to my patient, not just to the blacks, but underprivileged uh, patient. <clears throat> I understand that as a social worker, uh, sometimes we're not appreciated. So on behalf of the, the social workers here, you know, I think that it's time that we are shown that we're appreciated. What I'm tired of hearing is that, just be grateful that you have a job. Um, be grateful that you're being paid what you're paying. I have a family and thank God my mother and father taught me never to depend on your job. Always have something put on the side. And this is what I did. You know, but at the same time, I struggled. We went to school. We educated ourselves. And I'm here as a licensed social worker and sometimes, that's sometimes, all the time, we want to be appreciated. We don't want to be told that be appreciative that you have a job. If there's a contract, there's no reason for us to be up here feeling that we're begging and we're demanding something. We work, we work very hard. And I'm not here for the money. I stayed here 36 years because this is my community. I appreciate every patient that I serve. <clears throat> if I was thinking about the money, I wouldn't be here. <clears throat> but I honestly 
enjoy my job. I appreciate what I'm doing and I love what I'm doing. And the patients are the ones that makes you feel that you're doing something, that you're being paid. <clears throat> what they tell you and what they appreciate makes up for what you're not being rewarded, but you're not being paid. <clears throat> so I'm saying to the panel, the board members, just don't sit and just say, oh, okay, well, listen, <clears throat> treat us with dignity, with respect. Honor the contract because we should never be able to come here and stand here and say, wait a minute, you know, I'm not gonna take up any more time, but I just wanted to say that I'm just grateful for my parents for teaching me the value. And I'm grateful that I live my dream to be here to serve my community. Thank you. In, uh, this is uh, our 31st uh, annual meeting that I've been, and I've only broken the rule twice about not responding before, so I'll break it a third time, uh, just because I, I, I'm grateful that, that all of you came out and uh, gave the board an understanding of how great social work is at health and hospitals. And I, I would uh, certainly, as a public health doctor, affirm that it's a more difficult job than it is at other hospitals. Our patients have more needs, um, and you stretch yourself and your resources uh, to meet those needs. And I do understand that. I do appreciate it. Um, I believe uh, that we will have a resolution very soon. I mention it also because I don't want you to uh, anybody to leave. I want you to encourage our colleagues, your colleagues, uh, to stay. Um, we have been uh, working with your union, and we believe that we have a solution that will be come forth. It isn't signed, so it's not public. I can't talk about it I, except to say that I I think that it will you know, uh, answer, you know, the, the correct uh, request for equity, which is what we want to do. And you remember that while I am very proud of the fact that we achieved it for nurses, it wasn't fast. I did not get that done quickly. Um, you all understand that the city system, you know, is not a quick system for answering any question. Um, I mean, that's it, part of it is good. It's democracy. It's, it's all of the pieces that it takes to, to make something happen. But uh, uh, my own uh, son uh, started uh, January a social work program. Uh, I couldn't be more proud of him at, at his career choice. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm only hoping that I'm successful to convince him to work at health and hospitals when he, uh, that'll be his choice, of course. Um, but I, I do recognize the great work that you do, and I'm hopeful that uh, when we get to announce um, with the, with your union sort of the the agreement that it will meet will, will meet your need. So thank you. Thank you. Um, the next speaker is Eileen Garvin Kazanji, senior sales executive from Schneps Media. And after that is Deborah Wallace. Eileen. Um, so then the next speaker is Deborah Wallace, a registered nurse representing the National Council of Negro Women's Queens County Section. Good evening. I'm going to make a little adjustment because Jennifer Henry is actually the nurse speaking on behalf of the organization, the National Council of Negro Women, and then I'll follow behind her. Okay. That's all. Okay. Yes, that's fine. Good evening, everyone. Dr. Katz, 
panelists and the excellent, excellent leadership of NC H and H Queens, fellow community members. It is the pleasure of National Council of Negro Women Incorporated, NCNW Queens County Section, to participate during this annual forum and to share our organizational testimony regarding the established collaborative relationship with H and H Queens. NCNW Queens County Section is a community service organization consisting of volunteers who give their time to coordinate programs centering community service, cultural arts, education, economic development, international support of women and girls, health, including maternal, child health, and vaccine access to adults, social justice in Southeast Queens. Over the past several years, Queens County Section Maternal and Child Health Committee has developed an invaluable collaborative relationship with h, &H Queens to address health and racial disparities, which disproportionately impact the health and birth outcomes of mothers and birthing people and infants of colors. We value the health system contribution to our, to our in-person and virtual community service project which educate community members about maternal and child health disparities and also address how they can become advocate to improve systems. Every time we reach out to H&H &H Queens, their leadership and staff are most responsive. Their nursing WIC prenatal clinical and maternity unit staff has helped to inform patients about events and also join as guest presenters for the Queens County Sexual Bertram Forum addressing black maternal mortality crisis, promoting breastfeeding, support and nutrition, and educating community about premature birth. Representative from medical centers and community-based WIC program have also joined us in person health and wellness events, providing information and education about breastfeeding, as well as donating supply to, to support mothers birthing people in their breastfeeding journey. The NCNW section, Queens County section, has established a prematurity support service project in recognition of November as Prematurity Awareness Month. As a component of this service project, the leadership and maternity unit, Mother Baby and NICU, are always welcoming and gracious in providing opportunities for our maternal and child health committee to deliver bag filled items to support the parents and preemies during their NICU journey. It is an honor for us to be the service to the families who receive such excellent care from the dedicated staff. We still talk about the very first visit to NICU in 2020, when quadruplets were born right after our arrival. We were told that the gift bags were timely and needed by the family. As part of our work, we advocate for the inclusion of doulas as part of the expecting parents' pregnancy, birthing and postpartum journey. We held two events. We were able to connect expecting mothers throughout our communities to doulas who could provide support needed to improve the probability of having a safer and healthier birth outcome. The Hope Doula from H&H &H Queens were excellent in educating participants about their role and answering questions. The members of the NCNW Incorporated Queens County Section, Maternal and Child Health, and the Health Committee would especially like to extend our gratitude to Mr. Cleon Edwards, to Ms. Deborah Ramatar, Ms. Shirley Gabera, Assistant Nursing Director Tiffany Johnson, she's no longer here at this hospital, Marie Jean Baptiste, Barbara Holmes, Mother Baby, and the NICU. We look forward to continue our collaboration with you this year and beyond. In service, Sakina Black President, Deborah Wallace, First Vice President, Pamela Davis, Maternal and Child Health Committee Chairperson, Jennifer Henry, Health Committee Chair. Thank you. And now, it, Deborah Wallace, do you have? Do you also want to speak? Okay. Good evening. Thank you for allowing us this platform. 
I am Deborah Wallace, also of NCNW, Queens County Section, First Vice President. The Queens County Section has established a wonderful partnership with Queens Hospital to bring awareness to the special attention that is related to or affecting the prematurity of the newborn or the prevention of neonatal mortality. The goal of our events is to address health and racial disparities in maternal and child health by informing women of color and their partners about the role of a doula, the prenatal support team, and minimize barriers to reduce the likelihood of premature and adverse birth outcomes for both mother and baby. We plan to continue to support our advocacy to include mental health. It is very important that we vote for legislation to include measures to create a reproductive freedom, equity grant programs, or pregnancy apps on maternal health care and birthing standards that community organizations and community hospitals can share with the expectant parents. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Stanley Richards, also a registered nurse, also with the National County of Negro Women. Not here. Okay. Um, and so our final speaker um, of the evening is on um, Gozika on Walu, um, president of the Rosedale Lions Club. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. I have been given the formidable task of delivering a repartee of recognition about our dear lion, Merlene Smith Sotillo, who happens to be the president and CEO of the Sickle Cell Awareness Foundation Corporation International. But before I commence with the recognition, I would like to give you a brief synopsis of what lionism is and also lend you a lens that will give a scope about my club in particular, and why we are committed to serve the community that we have been sworn to serve for its betterment, and also to provide our constituents with a better quality of life. At the Rosedale's Lions Club, our mission is to empower Lions, Lions Clubs, volunteers, members of the community, and partners to improve their overall well-being. We also endeavor to educate and strengthen our communities and to support those in need through humanitarian services and also by leveraging grants that impact lives globally. We aim to strengthen our communities and to support those in need through humanitarian services and also, once again, by leveraging grants. Our vision is to be the global leader in both community and humanitarian service, and our motto is committed to serve. Our vision is to be the global leader in both community and humanitarian service. Tonight, I am going to place the high beam of exuberance and recognition on our dearest club member, Lion Merlene Smith Sotia. Lion Merlene has held the position of committee chairperson since 2021. Since assuming the post, she has exceeded our expectations in various capacities. She's a person that has volunteered her time, her talents, and treasures tirelessly to our initiatives, including assuming several supervisory roles in our executive and advisory boards. And also she has been one of the driving forces behind helping us to cultivate several partnerships with hospitals and also to curate various sponsorships various community, uh, with various community-based organizations. The Rosedale's Lions Club has partnered with the Sickle Cell Awareness Foundation Corporation International in various competencies and capacities. For example, we have conducted several feedings for the children of the residents of the Saratoga in shelter. We have also partnered with SCAPSI on numerous toy drives, winter wears and coat drives, and we are currently in the process of delivering a Super 7 Symposium series, which covers various health and wellness issues, also expounding on several cancers that are the perils in our communities. May I also add that Lion Merlin was also instrumental in acquiring Miss Linda Balloon as one of the speakers and she delivered two resounding symposiums that covered the topics of cervical cancer in January and our last installment, colorectal cancer in March. 
We were blown away with her delivery and her expertise on the various subject matters. And we would also like to thank Ms. Linda Ballone for all that she does. Lyon has been recognized by our Lions Club International's District 20K1, which covers both Brooklyn and Queens for all of her efforts to fight against the debilitating disease known as sickle cell. She was appointed as a District 20K1 sickle cell chairperson in the Lionistic year 2022 under our district governor, Ing Ingrid Andrews Campbell. Since her tenure as sickle cell disease chairperson for the district, she has been instrumental in the planning and preparation for a district-sponsored health fair and wellness expo at the Roy Wilkins Park. She has also been instrumental in the planning and preparation of several blood drives in the southeastern part of Queens, also known as Jamaica, to be precise. And she was very instrumental with working with Senator James Sanders Jr. to help get a bill passed concerning sickle cell so she can continue to pursue her passion of advocacy by making community members aware that there are services for sickle cell patient population that can also be accessed by implementing the right practices and protocol that she is fighting to cement in place. We commend Lion Merlene Smith-Sotia for all the time and tedious work that she has mustered in all her might and will continue to do so as we support her efforts to continue to, pro to promote sickle cell awareness by way of significant impact, education, and substantive advocacy for those that are suffering from this disease. Her work is very near and dear to me because I am from a family in Nigeria, West Africa, that has been plagued with this debilitating disease to the point that we had to change our last name to Onwalu. My last name means death will not take us anymore. And with that in mind, I conclude my repartee and recognition of Lion Merlin Smith Sotillo. I want to thank you all for this opportunity to stand before you and to speak on behalf of my club, the Rose Dales Lions Club Incorporated, and to recognize our very own Lion Merlin Smith Sotillo of the Rose Dales Lions Club Incorporated and the president and CEO of the Sickle Cell Awareness Foundation Corporation International. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and with that, we'll conclude our program uh, for the evening. Thank you so much for being here and uh, please get home safely.